See what happens when we hear testimony. There's, there's something absolutely beautiful about it in which we connect the story of that person with our story, and we connect the story of God in that person with our life and our story. And that is the power of your story. And that is what you carry into the world. But it's also shown how important we are with one another, how vital it is we journey with one another. And so we will talk and do some stuff about mission in this, but we need each other. And uh, we're going to look at this passage from Luke 10, and that is going to tell us how much we need each other. Um, so I'm going to read a good chunk. Uh, so uh, buckle up, and we're going to read some scripture together and allow God's word to minister to us. So after this, the Lord appointed uh, 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them, and if not, it will return to you. Stay there eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you, heal the sick who are there, and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, Even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes." But it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted to the heavens? No, you will go down to Hades. Whoever listens to you listens to me. Whoever rejects you rejects me. Whoever rejects me rejects him who sent me. Seventy-two returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, "I I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. At that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you are pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows who the Son is except the Father, and no one knows who the Father is except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. And we'll stop there. So I love this passage. I love it because it's the 72 anonymous followers of Jesus. They're not the 12 superstar apostles even though they weren't really superstars at all. But the 72, we don't know who they are. But there are some people who started to be around Jesus, and as his ministry has grown, they're in that crowd of people. And in chapter 9, Jesus sends out the 12 in exactly the same way and gives them power and authority, and they come back, and they've seen the kingdom come in in this way. And then Jesus says it, it can be expanded. I'm going to send 72 others. And this is so unique in the Gospels that it just makes sure that we don't think that it was just the apostles. This was the sign of the future church coming into being where everyone is given authority and power to minister. And Jesus is saying exactly what we've been looking at, which is it all starts with our response to him, your names are written in heaven. It is because we belong to him. It starts in that. That's where the joy is. That's where the foundation is. That's where it, the source is from the one, from, from Jesus. Then, even though we're just like little children, he calls them little children. They're not 
great. They're not experts. They're not people who are, who are seasoned ministers. They're just like little children, he says. But he's rejoicing in the reality that has just been revealed, which is God wants to use people in their weakness, in their limitations, in, in, the, in the sense of them being like children, rather than in their expertise and their strength. And so we, we, we hear again that it's not about us. We're not enough. But he is enough. And then we discover that he has given them authority to trample on snakes and scorpions. He's sent them in his authority and his power to go into the harvest field to say that they can heal the sick and they can say that the kingdom of God has come near to you. The really interesting thing is, is they say, even the demons submit to us. He didn't tell them to cast out demons. <laughs> he just told them to heal the sick and to proclaim the kingdom. But God's kingdom broke out as they went in his name and they did that work. And the thing is, is that they had a choice. He, he sent them to their assignment, to the town that he was going to go into, and he sent them two by two, and he says, go there. And it's really significant that they go two by two. It's just another little moment that says, we need each other. This is not a solo thing. Jesus never sent people on their own. He sent them together. Even to get a donkey, he sent two of them. And it's like, no, it has to be together. That's, what, that's why we're in the church, where, the, where we are that ecclesia, we're on the, the, the road with Jesus in his mission, but we're together. And that's why we have to keep asking, who are we called with? Who do we need to stand with and, and be in relationship with as Christians in the church? And then they had to be willing to be sent. And they had a moment where they had a choice. Mary had a choice. Martha had a choice. These 72 had a choice. Will they go? Now, we know at the end of the story, they come back full of joy. Even the demons submit to us in your name. If you ask them in that moment, were they glad they said yes and that they went? They'd say, yes, it was amazing. But I wonder how they felt before that in the moment of choice, where they've been told you're going to go out and you're not allowed to take anything with you. And this is, again, this whole thing about do not depend on your own ability. You are not to take anything with you that would cause you to be able to be um, do this in your own strength, manage the process, rely on something else. Jesus is propelling them into relationship with people because they have to find somewhere to stay and they have to find something to eat because they have nothing with them. So they're going into a village commissioned by Jesus going, somehow we've got to meet some people and we've got to share our lives with them and we've got to share the kingdom of God with these people. And they have nothing else to rely on. And they must have felt absolutely scared. I remember doing some door-to-door -door work, uh, telling uh, we were going to do the Jesus film, and uh, we were going to drop Jesus films into people's um, doors, and we went around knocking on doors in advance of that to say, we're coming, and would you like to have this film? And we were doing that, and we had some training, and I said, we're going to have two groups this morning. We're going to have those of you who are scared about doing this, and those of you who are absolutely terrified. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to say to you, I still get scared. I still have a moment, I still have moments of fear where I, I go, I think I'm going to fall flat on my face in this moment. I think this isn't going to go well. I said, you know, when I sent that email, I thought I was going to be laughed out of court. It was, it was, how, how on earth is that going to work? And in that moment of stepping out, the fear is still there. If anybody says that if you've got fear that you're not actually following the Lord, it's, it's a nonsense. The fear is still there, but it does not rule in our hearts if we put the love of God in our hearts. And so we're aware of the risk, but we do it anyway because of the love of the Father for us and that we know we're safe in his love for us. And so they must have been absolutely scared stiff of what was going to happen. But they went. 
they were sent. And out of everything we looked at this morning, really what we're looking at is that the church has, an, has a commission and it's been sent to bring the kingdom. And that means that we have been sent, wherever we are on Monday morning, wherever we are in our families, in our leisure, we've been sent there. You don't have to have had a blinding flash of light that that's your call. Wherever you are, you're sent. You're Jesus representative. And we have to go with a willingness to bring his kingdom. Just to summarize this, so often in the church, we have treated the church as if it's a bank vault. That you come to faith and you come into the church and it's the job of the clergy to look after you and keep you safe. You're the precious gold that Jesus has won and you're to keep you in the bank vault of the church and keep you safe until you go to heaven or Jesus returns. And that's the job of the church. So you'll come on a Sunday and you'll be in your small group and hopefully you'll make it and that's the job of, of the church. But actually the church is a post office sorting office. You come in, you get sorted out, you discover your, your assignment, and you get sent there. And that's what the church is meant to be. That the, the, the sorting office is an absolutely vital part of that. That's where God works in us and transforms us, and we, and we are renewed and continue to be strengthened and, and filled with the Spirit and taught the Word of God, and, and that's absolutely vital. But it's not meant to keep you and contain you. It's meant to send you and release you. And if that hasn't happened for you, then I'm really sorry. But that's not just the, the leadership here. That's the culture and the wineskin that we've inherited in the church, in our nation. Which is why I think God is having to do this reforming and refounding work of, in the church. Because even though he's poured out his spirit upon us, it's been contained. It's been like inside the church. And that was never the picture of the New Testament church. There was this outward connection into the world as the Holy Spirit moved them and led them. And for us, like those 72, we have to be willing to be sent. And in that moment, we have a choice as to whether we will obey. And one of the things we've lost, and I, I refer to in the book, is the understanding that obedience is the heart of discipleship. And we have lost an understanding of that, because what will happen, it might well happen today, is you'll come in and it's so encouraging to see people take notes and be hungry for God's word and engaging. But if you never do anything with it, it's pointless. It might have been a great experience. You might have been strengthened, and we thank God for all of that. But Jesus said the people who hear the word of God and do nothing with it are like the people who build on sand. And because they never did anything with it, it hasn't become part of them. It didn't actually take root. And the result is when the storms come, they fall over. But those who hear the word of God and put it into practice are like those who build upon the rock. That's what Jesus said he would do with his church. And the key is we've got to learn to put it into practice. A phrase that I love that I nicked from somebody, but I can't remember who it is, is that we've been educated beyond the level of our obedience. And then what that means is you've heard loads of sermons if you've been in church for any length of time. And if you just did what you'd heard in the sermons, that would be amazing. You've got enough information already. The problem is, is we haven't got enough activation and transformation. And so we have to learn to do it. We have to obey. And part of the problem is, is that in obedience, there is this fear and this risk. So as I said, I've got a, I've got a two-year-old grandson, and uh, he now runs very, very quickly. But I was there in the moment that he learned to walk. Uh, and uh, I was with his mum, and his mum was on one side of the room, I was on the other side of the room, and his mum called to him, and, uh, and Alfie started to toddle from the place he was holding on to me, and he got halfway across the room, and he fell over. And I guess what she said, she said, oh no, 
We've got a non-walking child. Oh, no, it's terrible. How did we end up with one of those? He's never going to walk for the rest of his life. Oh, no. We're going to have to come up with all kinds of strategies of how to move him around without him being able to walk. It's terrible. Of course she didn't say that. What did she say? Get up, Alfie. Get up, try again. It doesn't matter. It's okay. You're not hurt. Get up, try again. And he tried again and he fell down again. And then he tried again and he walked and he made it across the room. Now, why did she do that? I want you just to think of the logic of her thought process. She did it because she, Alfie was born to walk. He was given the abilities to walk. There was nothing wrong with him. And so she knew that he had the potential to walk. What he had to do was to try to walk. And it was only if she had the wrong mindset that said, oh, no, he's not born to walk, that she would then say any of that ridiculous thing. It would be crazy. It would be crazy because he was born to walk. You and I were given the Holy Spirit when we came to know Jesus Christ. And we were born to walk, friends. We were born to bring the kingdom. We were born to see Jesus use us. We were born to see people transformed. He commissioned us to be his witnesses, to make disciples, to see people saved and healed and transformed by his grace and his love. But it's not been easy. And we might have tried and fallen over. We might have looked at other people trying it and going, I'm not trying that. And we've ended up with a version of the Christian faith that says, I'm not one of those Christians that can do that. I'm not one of those people that was born by the Holy Spirit to do that. And that's just a lie. But it's a lie that's designed to contain us and to limit what we're meant to do and what God wants to do through us. And as I said, it's not necessarily easy. But we need the church to be a place where we can encourage each other, learn together, equip each other, and then be sent out to the places that we're called to be. And that's what we need each other for. And we have to learn to be able to talk about stuff and encourage each other and and enable us to do what we're called to do. And wherever you're working out in terms of that assignment... There is a place in which you are called to go and do that work. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to do a little bit of um, practical training. Everybody's going, woo! (laughs) We're going to do a little bit of practical training. (laughs) So in Holy Trinity Leicester, um, where I used to be vicar, we uh, we had really established a vision for this missionary lifestyle that we're meant to live and this and a call to reach others with the gospel and we've done strategy uh, where we use these communities that were centered around uh, reaching a certain group of people missional communities and people were trying to do that and live out their discipleship with one another and we'd really worked hard on that but people weren't becoming Christians. They, some of them were becoming Christians through Alpha, and some of them were becoming Christians on a Sunday, but they weren't becoming Christians in these communities. So on one occasion, we, we had uh, a group of those leaders. There were about 100 of them leading these 20 or so missional communities in Leicester. And we got the leadership teams together, and I asked them this question. And I said, how many of you have shared your faith in the last year? And by sharing your faith, I mean giving a testimony of what Jesus has done in your life recently, um, explaining the gospel in some way, giving an apologetic sort of answer to a question, a Christian answer to a question of life and challenge at that time, offering to pray for people or making an invitation to church like we heard in, in the testimony earlier. How many of you have done that in the last year? And less than 20% of them had. Now, I went, went home and I wept. I wept for two reasons. I wept first because these were our best Christians. And if they weren't doing it, nobody was doing it. And I wept because it was my job to equip them. My job was to do that sorting office stuff. My job wasn't to keep them and to keep them happy in church. My job was to release them into their kingdom assignment and potential. And I hadn't done that. So we went on a journey. And... 
First of all, we, we wrestled that through with, with the staff team. We asked those people a couple of other questions. And we said, why? Because we, we're, we're in a good church. We talk about the gospel. We sing songs about the gospel. We talk about the kingdom. We, we, we believe it all. We're, we're great theorists. We're just not great practitioners. So why not? They gave me two reasons. They were brave enough and, and honest enough to give me two reasons. One is they did not live with a day-by-day compassion for their lost friends and the lostness of their lives without Jesus. They did not get on their knees before the Father and say, Lord, would you save them? Would you break into their lives? Would you, would you come and would you use me? So they weren't living with that compassion. And that, that's all found in prayer. And that's why we come back to prayer being so important. Second thing is that they said, we don't know how to do this. We do, and what they're meaning by that is that they did not know how to do it in a way that they thought had a chance to work. And the technical term is a cognitive dissonance. They go, yes, I think this is something I should do, but there's a, there's a dissonance, a sense of this isn't going to work. So that means that behaviorally, I'm not ever going to do that. So we went on, how are we going to learn how to do this? And as a staff team, we first did this, and we, we practiced some ways of doing that and working that out. And we discovered that God began to use us to connect with people and see people come to faith. We then took the leaders, that 100 group of leaders, we took them through some training. And we saw that at the end of that training, I asked them, how many of you have shared your faith? And 100% of them had shared their faith. And what does that tell us? It said that they wanted to be those, those Christians who could do this, but they didn't feel able to until we'd gone through that process of training. And then we went and shared it with the church. And I used up all the trust in my bank with them in terms of as a leader over eight years with that church. And I said, I'm cancelling everything except training in how to uh, share the gospel and live missionally with other people. So we're cancelling Alpha, so you don't think that other people will lead people to Jesus. We're going to cancel some other stuff that we did, which was great. And we're going to do training every two weeks. And we're going to train you. And then two weeks later, we're going to ask you, how did it go? Because obedience is the heart of discipleship. And they hated me. Absolutely hated me. <laughs> people came up to me and they say, I'm no longer safe in my small group where we were doing this training. And I graciously said, I think you're saying you're no longer comfortable. And they were gracious enough to agree with me. And they'd come up to me like Karen, and she said, I would never do this, John. I'm not one of those Christians, like I said. But I will, I'm part of the church, so I'll be obedient. I'm here. I want to be part of this, but I can never, ever do this. So I'm just letting you know. I'm just being honest. I said, okay, just, just hang in there. And so... After the first two months, there were almost no testimonies that were encouraging. <laughs> it was like tumbleweed <laughs> when we asked for testimonies. But in the second two months, I'd said to them we were going to do it for four months. And at the end of four months, if people started to come to know Jesus, we would go back to some more fun stuff. Um, <laughs> and, and after the first two months, nothing Second two months, somebody got up every week in church and said, I led somebody to Jesus this week. And so, friends, we were born to walk. But we don't necessarily know how to do this. So I'm just going to take you through just some very simple tools and encourage you um, in this work. Because once you've got your assignment, you then have to know how to bring the kingdom. So um, I, I summarize this as, first of all, we've already talked about this. Release God's blessing. Wherever you are, you have the authority to pray from the throne and release the blessing of God in that place. Jesus says to these 72, go to that place and say, peace be with you. Release the peace and the presence of God in that place consistently. Now, you can go up to people and knock on doors and just literally be a literalist and just say, peace be with you. And... Uh, that would be an obedient step, and good luck, and let's review that and see how that goes, and that, that might work really well. Um, 
But my encouragement to you is, is you don't, at this stage, have to even talk to anybody. You start by just consistently praying the blessing of God over people and over your workplace and over your streets and over your family. And honestly, don't do anything else until you've started to do that. Because in that place of prayer, you'll begin to catch the compassionate heart of the Father for those people. So start there, please. And that's the gift of this, is I'm not even asking you to talk to anybody. You can do this as like on a secret assignment. You're a secret agent of the kingdom, just praying the blessing of God wherever he's put you. But then Jesus says some more challenging things and says, when you go into that house um, and somebody receives you, stay there eating and drinking whatever they give you for the worker deserves his, his wages. And then when you're there, heal the sick and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. So we're to demonstrate the kingdom and we're to tell people about the kingdom of God. How do we do that? This is the question from those people in Holy Trinity. How do I do that? What does that look like in our culture today? And what we ended up saying is it looks like asking questions and telling stories. So asking questions is you meet somebody and you're, you're doing that point of interaction, the peace be with you moment. And what you're wanting to do in that peace be with you interaction is you're wanting to see where those people are at spiritually. You're wanting to see how they respond. So you're not trying to give them the whole gospel at that point. It's that peace be with you moment where you're going, how are they responding to what I'm doing? And so asking questions is, how are you? And when somebody shares a need, you offer to pray for them. And you say, can I pray for you? So that links this thing. And if they say no, which sometimes people do, then you just know, okay, this person isn't open. But if they say yes, then actually anything can happen. So I'll tell you Karen's story because she's the one who said, I'll never do this. She goes into her university administration office and every day. And then one Sunday she comes to me and says, you'll never guess what happened, John. <laughs> and uh, I said, what happened? She said, Leslie has been next to me. I know that Ed, Leslie's been really up, upset for a number of, uh, number of weeks. And she was telling me how miserable her life is and again. And because we've had all of this training on when somebody shares a need, you say to them, could I pray for you? I actually said it, and I couldn't stop myself saying it, and I really wish I'd never said it, but I said, oh, that's so bad. Could, could I pray for you? And to my horror, she said yes. <laughs> and so I prayed for her, and Leslie wept, and there was a sense of God touching her. And then Leslie said these profound words. She said two things. One is, I think that is the first time I've ever appeared in somebody else's prayers. Isn't that amazing? The offer of prayer is such a compassionate response to somebody's need. It's weird. Remember, I said, do the weird stuff. But at the same time, it is compassionate. It is showing that you listened to them. And it's showing that you care enough about them to respond to that, them sharing that need with you. And you're responding in a way that they might not understand or expect, but you are definitely responding in love. And this has to be a ministry of love. So you ask them, how are you? And they share a need. And if there's the opportunity and it feels appropriate, and generally it is, you just say, I know this may sound a little bit strange, but I wonder... Could I pray for you? And more people will say yes. So to help the people at Holy Trinity believe me in this, I said, we're going to have a couple of weeks in these two months where we're going to go out door knocking. And because I know that what you're most worried about is when you do this stuff with people you know and love, um, it's really going to mess up the relationships and it's not going to go very well. So we're going to practice on people you don't know. And uh, so we went out and said, anybody who wants to come with me, let's go and knock some doors, and we're going to offer to pray for people. And over those two weeks, um, over 100 people came out on the streets, and we knocked on some doors, and 50% of the, 
of the 1,500 doors we knocked on, it was a good sample size, 50% let us pray with them. Some of that was just polite English people who didn't know how to say no. <laughs> but some of it was profound. Jesus met people. People were healed. People came to faith. We didn't even train them to do that. That's the, even the demon submit stuff. But they just realize actually people are open. And the other thing that, that Leslie had said to Karen was that for the last three months, I've been going to bed so miserable, and I've been saying to God, if you're there, would you please show yourself to me? And Karen never knew that. But what she had to do was just do a little thing to see whether or not Leslie was ready and open to, to spiritual things and to the gospel. You can look around at the world and you can make your judgment on people to say they're not ready and God, nothing is happening in their lives. But I promise you, if you start praying, stuff will start to happen. God will open up people to you. It won't be straightforward. It won't be you're going to hit the bullseye every time. But it's this journey of I'm, all I'm asked to do is a simple thing, which is how are you and what can I pray for you? Now, why do you think actually praying with somebody rather than doing the slightly easier thing, say, I'm going home to pray, I'll be praying for you. Why do you think that that could be significant? I'd love you to come up with two or three reasons for that for me. So why do you think praying with somebody is so powerful? Thank you. It shows them that you're really going to do it. Exactly. It's not just and so it shows you that you're really going to do it. It actually happened. That prayer took place. And when God answers that prayer, they went flipping heck. They prayed that and that happened. That's like, that really opens up people. That starts to mess with their heads and, and starts getting them thinking. Yeah. So in that moment, the Holy Spirit can touch them. And so it's, it's a moment where you can actually say, God, would you come? And he does. And once he does, you're talking about what's just happened rather than trying to persuade them that God's real. And so as happened with Leslie, God met her. As happened with Vicky, God met them. It doesn't always happen like that, but God does do that. Um, I'll go there and then I'll come back to you. Yeah. Brilliant. So such a good answer. It shows them you can have a close relationship with God. This is utterly fascinating to people. They, you are talking to God in front of them. They've never even thought that's possible. And yet there you are doing that in front of them. And I know that it's weird, but they are fascinated by that. They go, OK, that's really interesting. And you discover what it sounds like and what it looks like. And it's not all mumbo jumbo. It's just really simple. And that's really interesting to them. So it's really personal. It creates this moment of personal connection, a deep personal connection. It's, it's a deeply intimate moment. You're not doing anything weird in terms of that, but it's, it's like you're talking to God with them in that moment. And that's just happened. Now you've got something to interact about and say, okay, how, did, how was that? And you follow up with another question. You know, do you know God? Where are you with God? What do you think about what's just happened? And you just have a conversation. It's just natural conversation. So this is why it's worth the risk, friends. That's all I'm doing in that. I'm just trying to convince you it's worth the risk. When you do it, God does turn up. When you do it, people are generally open. And even when people have said no to me, I've never had a level of rejection that has um, been deeply hurtful to me personally. But as we heard in the testimony, there is a risk around doing it in the workplace. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, but we have to be aware of that. And so there has to be an emotional intelligence in that as well, in terms of the dynamics in the workplace, which are in uniquely structured environment. And in your families, if you've got long-term members of your family, 
um, who aren't yet Christians, then you, you have to find the moments. You can't just badger them constantly. There has to be a moment. And you're praying for them, and you're looking for those moments. You think, oh, I think this might be a moment. So we're going to pray for one another now. Um, so in a moment, I'm going to ask you to find um, a friendly stranger who you don't know. Um, so we're just going to create that sense of uh, just building relationship. And you're going to ask them, how are you? And you're going to be really kind. You're not going to make it work for it. You're not going to play hard to get or anything like that. <laughs> you're going to just share a genuine need at whatever level you feel you want to. You can just say, I'm, I'm a little tired today. Um, or uh, something more significant, that because God is here. He's going to hear this prayer. And in that moment, you are going to pray a very simple prayer. So here are the rules. You use their name. Honestly, I'm so bad at remembering names. A number of times I'm praying for people generally because I should have remembered their names. Try and remember their name. Thank God for that person and that he loves them. Pray using the language they use, not the problem that you, they should have told you about, but the thing they actually said. If it's healing, I would like you to pray in a very simple prayer that you command healing. So you speak to that condition and you say, be healed in Jesus' name. And then at the end of it, say, I pray that this person would know your love for them. Amen. Keep your eyes open. Don't pray in tongues. Don't go long prayers. God doesn't need it. Out in the world, stuff happens really quickly. In church, it seems like there's a bit more stuff that can happen and we need longer. But in, in, um, I've seen somebody healed of a really um, bad neck injury where they'd been on a, on a checkout in a... Uh, in a supermarket, and they had to now be on the person who comes and sorts out the error on the self-service desks because they could just wave their ticket because they couldn't be on the desk anymore because they couldn't go like that. And uh, sorry, Andy, I know we've... Yes, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's exactly what you're struggling with, and I'm sorry that I prayed for you and you didn't get healed, but, I, this, but out in the world, I prayed for Jean uh, after I said, oh, how did that happen? And she said, oh, it was on this. This is why I'm on this desk. I said, oh, sometimes God heals people. Can I pray for you? I prayed the shortest prayer, and she was healed in an instant. Uh, there was somebody who had a broken toe I met while I was walking my dog, and we were in the rain, and our dogs were fighting. <laughs> and I had my umbrella up, and it was not a holy moment, but I prayed, and I commanded healing in the toe, and, uh, and she was instantly healed. Um, so God does do this. It doesn't require a long prayer. So we're thanking God. We're saying... Um, Whatever the condition is, we pray for it or we command healing. We ask him to show his love to them and we say amen. Simple as that. So go and find a stranger. Both of you say to each other, how are you? Um, and then after the first person says that, you offer to pray for them. You pray for them, a really short prayer. And then we'd swap. Okay? Off you go. Okay, we're going to draw that to a close. So wherever you are in your prayers, do bring those prayers to a close. I know I'm being really tough. And I realize you will have had a nice conversation beforehand. But I promise you, some of you are praying far too long. And I know you can't help it. I know. But out in the world, at a supermarket checkout, you don't have that much time. <laughs> now, you don't have to go back to your original seats because I'm going to get you to move again in a moment. So, that was the asking questions bit. Peace be upon you. How are you? Can I pray for you? Really simple. It's, it's no... Harder than that. The fact you've done it today, if you've never done that before, means you might do it in the world. What you have to pray in that sense of intention is, as I did, Lord, give me somebody to pray for. I'm available. That's when you really believe that you, God, you want God to use you. Give me, and that causes your antennae to be up. I'm looking. 
Who is it that I can bring your blessing into their lives? Now, the telling stories is testimony. So that's how you tell the kingdom of God is here. Now, we can do a lot more on how to explain the gospel in a really simple way, but we don't have time today. But we can tell a testimony. And your testimony doesn't have to be your big testimony of coming to faith. That can work. I remember when I was with my friend Chris, he was also a professor, a history professor in a university. Um, I'd, I'd met him, he was in a band in a, in a, in a, in a gig that, uh, that I was at and we got talking. I said, would you like to meet up for coffee? We met up for coffee and then I said to him, would you ever like to, um, uh, to hear more about faith? He said, I'd really like that. I said, okay, so we'll have that conversation. And we're sitting in a coffee shop and somebody, people are going in and out to go and have a, a smoke outside and it was winter and I was just being grumpy. I go, oh, it's so annoying, isn't it? It's like these people, why are they so addicted to c- cigarettes have to go out in the cold? Isn't it terrible? And so I'm not being Christian at all, honestly. <laughs> so it's just so you, um, to, to deal with reality. And he said, have you ever smoked? And I said, yeah, I smoked when I was 11. And he said, what? Well, tell, me, <laughs> tell me about that. And I then could tell my testimony, because 11 and 15, I was an absolute nightmare. And I rebelled against everything in my, my parents' faith. And then 15, I came back to the Lord and had a really a real encounter with the Lord. And I told him my testimony, and he had tears in his eyes, and he said, I want a story like that. <coughs> and so I said, let's meet up and read the Bible together. We had four sessions over the next few months reading gospel stories. And he then realized he had to forgive somebody, and he realized he couldn't, and he realized he needed forgiveness himself, and, and he came to know the Lord. Uh, and he then went on to lead another community and many other people to Jesus, and he's now ordained. And, and that was all because I told him my story. But it could just be you tell the story of what's happened recently. Um, so I had William in my house, uh, and uh, William and Sarah. Sarah's um, at the church. Uh, she, you know, all these lovely people. Please hear me. I love these people. But... She never reads her Bible. She's on, uh, she won't even, so I've got 20 people in my house doing the Bible course at the moment, but she won't even come to do that because she's so scared about it. She has never been taught how to follow Jesus in her faith, but she's the PCC secretary. And uh, um, that's, that's, that's village life for you, honestly, it really is. <laughs> There's people on our PCC that never come to church, honestly, it's mad. As I said, I can't, I'd love to tell you all the stories. It's so funny. Uh, it's Vicar of Dibley. It really is. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, I got to know William uh, because uh, he had a classic car. Um, now, I met him at a social event, um, and we, we got talking. He shared with me how he didn't believe in God at all. And, uh, and I said, well, how do you explain the world being here? You're an engineer. That's just ridiculous that you believe it came out of nothing. He said, yeah, I know, that's the one thing that bothers me. Um, and then I said, so how do you explain love? You love your family. You've been talking to me about your family. Where did love come from if it didn't come from a personal God? He goes, yeah, I don't know. And I said, so we should talk about that sometime, William. And he said, yeah, we should. So we met up, we had the conversation. And then my daughter got married in the village, and he has a classic car. And in Bledlow, there were like 10 people with classic cars. <laughs> but he has a classic car. I said, William, would you come and uh, be the driver and provide the car for my daughter's wedding? He said, I'd love to do that. So in this passage, we let people serve us. Gives them value. Um, it was a village affair. People made cakes. They bought homemade pressed apple juice. They came and did everything for this wedding. It was amazing. And then about 20 of them came to the reception in the evening afterwards. They couldn't believe that we invited them to it, and they were part of our family. And William meets my uh, brother-in-law, who's a Christian, and William's had a fair amount to drink by then, and he says to my brother-in-law, oh, yeah, I love John, and he's, he's going to help me find out about Jesus, and I really want to know Jesus, and it's amazing, isn't it? And so I then know <laughs> that he's really open to this. He's a person of peace. <laughs> Alcohol happens sometimes. No, I can't. I, <laughs> I can't say that. No, please, please don't hear that. Um, so we have them around for a meal two weeks ago. 
And I'm saying, Lord, what testimony can I share with William? And I don't know, but I've gone into that meal with a desire to give a testimony. So just notice the intent. That's all it matters. You start to have a different approach to life. And William starts to say how he doesn't believe in God still, but he has this thing about how they ended up in the house they're in. It was a crazy story, and it involved him playing his little video game on his phone and him winning this game and then him feeling somehow that he would win this house and he should go back to this vendor and ask them to give uh, to accept an offer and they did and it was miraculous in his eyes and I went oh that's interesting so I said how about I tell you a God buying story William and he said okay so this is my story of buying our house when I left Holy Trinity left Leicester somebody gives me a prophetic word that uh, God is putting me on a very high peak to have influence in his church and they keep saying this phrase very high peak we're trying to buy this house in this village that my wife feels very cool to live in and uh, and this house is not going well, this, this, this bidding process. And we're getting people to pray. And somebody said, the house you're going to buy has a name and it has a significance. I said, okay. So this name was uh, the name of a Welsh mountain, Trevan. And when I looked up the translation from the Welsh, it literally said a very high peak. I went, okay, so we're meant to buy this house. This house has fallen through twice now on exchange day because the man can't commit to buying the next house. He's like, oh, yep, we're going through the process. I've accepted the offer. We're now going to exchange. Oh, no, actually, there's something about that other house I don't like. I'm praying about this. What should I do? I have this conviction that I should ring him up and offer him a different strategy. So I rang him up. I said, look, I know this has been difficult, but I want to let you know that God says that you should sell your house to me because he says I'm to live there. (laughs) And, uh, And he says... I don't believe in God, so that's just crazy. (laughs) I said, well, it doesn't matter if you believe in him or not. He's told me that. And if you sell your house to me, you will be blessed. He goes, what? (laughs) And I said, how about this as as a different strategy? You seem to find it hard to buy the next house and to commit to that. Why don't you sell your house to me without having another house to buy? I'll let you live in it for three months because I live in a vicarage rent free. And uh, by the time you have sold your house to me, um, you'll, you'll have a house to buy because God has promised that he's going to bless you if you sell to me. He said, that's mad. I said, I know it sounds bad, but honestly, God will bless you. And he said, but I could end up homeless because I won't have a house to live in. I said, no, but God's going to bless you. He said, no, I'm not doing that. Five days later, he says, deal. <laughs> he rings up and, uh, and we exchange... And within five days of exchange, he has bought another house, completed on another house. We never had to rent it to him. The estate agent said, have you got some, some, uh, some kind of superpower? And I said, well, actually, I have. It's Jesus. And he told me we're going to buy this house. So I tell this story to William. Because he's talking about how this house means something to him. And I, I tell him this house. He goes, that is amazing. And you can see his, his mind, his cogs in his mind begin to churn. I'm going to tell you one more story, and then you're going to tell your testimony to somebody. Um, you understand, I'm only telling you my best stories, but I'm telling you current ones. So that was from two weeks ago. Um, so I used to be chair of governors of a secondary school, a secular secondary school, and we had a finance committee meeting that was due to go to, but I had to go to Tanzania on mission. We had to rearrange the finance committee. And so I was coming back from Tanzania, and I knew what they were going to ask me at that rearranged finance committee the next day. What are they going to ask me? Where have you been? How did it go in Tanzania? What's been going on? Why did we rearrange it? So I knew they were going to ask me that question, and I have a testimony to tell them. So I've practiced my testimony because I get scared doing it. This is a finance committee. So I go there, and, uh, and I go in there, and they said, how was Tanzania? I said, well, we went to a water project, and we went to a school, and we saw an education project. And every day, we were meeting with people who we were praying for, and Jesus did the most amazing things. Somebody who was blind saw, and, and somebody who was lame walked. And people who were like, caught up with all kinds of evil oppression, they were set free, and it was just amazing. 
and I just left it. <laughs> and, and you can imagine how much these finance guys are so, feeling so awkward now. And I'm just loving it inside. <laughs> and then somebody said, so you're saying that happened last week, John. And I said, yeah, Jesus still does that today. Mohammed, who is a Muslim counselor sitting next to me, he said, I've had pain in my leg for three years and the, and the NHS has not been able to sort it out. And he puts his hand on me and says, I want to be well, John. And I said, I'll pray for you. But he goes, because the meeting goes on. And then a couple of days later, he rings me up and he says, John, we have to meet. I said, what, what do you want to meet about, Muhammad? He said, since I have touched you, I've had no pain. And I said, okay, let's meet up and talk about this. He then says to me when we meet, but the thing that bothers me more than that is that I've had peace like I've never had. And he literally said to me, he says, how do I become a Christian, John? So in Cafe Nero on Market Street in Leicester, he gave his life to the Lord. What is really sobering is that three months later, he died of a heart attack. So this is why it matters, friends. All because I'd learnt... Now, obviously, I'd seen amazing things happen, so there was a testimony, but I had a choice. A choice as to whether or not to live as a sent person or as just somebody who was just blessing people and being kind as the chair of governors. And I chose to tell the kingdom, tell the stories of the kingdom in the midst of a finance committee and God save somebody. So your story has that potential. It doesn't have to be the big story of your life. It just has to be something. And quite often you're looking to connect it with what somebody's just told you. I had some mental health problems. Okay, let me tell you how I had a really difficult time and how Jesus helped me. So, this, so the way you do it is there was a time in my life when I had some mental health difficulties. Then God did something. I prayed. I talked it through. I went for counseling, but as somebody, I went on that counseling journey. Somebody was praying for me. And I really found a place of peace, particularly when I went to church. Third, and now actually I don't have... I'm not living with that anymore, and Jesus has really brought me to a place of, of well-being and, and peace. So it's, there was a time, God did, and this is what has resulted. So I'd love you to find another friendly stranger, and when you find them, please don't have a long chat, because we do need to pray in this session in a moment. So you only have five minutes to do both stories. Both stories in five minutes, okay? No longer. And we saw this morning we could do five stories in less than 10 minutes. And so you can do it in two minutes. Find your person and just have a go. It doesn't have to be perfect. But try and be as short and, and straight as you can. Okay, so I know that that was really short. And I know that there's, um, there's lots to learn in all of that. If you need to talk anything through, please do with me over the day. But the church is meant to be the place where we learn to do this together. And by doing it in here, we can do it out there. And that's the aim. And this afternoon, you've got a chance to do it out there. So there's a chance to go out on the streets. And so maybe that's the thing for you today, is to go and practice on people that you don't care about. <laughs> I'm joking, okay, don't worry. Um, but it, it, it's so important that we take a step, that we take a step, and this afternoon you get a chance to you, for God to use you to touch other people. That's what's in you. You carry his authority and his presence within you. And it could be this afternoon that you take that step. But if not, pray. Lord, give me a chance to tell a testimony. Give me a chance to ask, ask somebody if I could pray for them in the place that you've sent me. So we're going to stand and put our attention back on the Lord Jesus um, as the one. And during this time, there's a chance for prayer again. And my encouragement to you is, if you recognize you need the power of the Holy Spirit 
Don't go without asking somebody to pray for you to be filled. I've raised faith for the gift of tongues. If you want to be released in tongues, then it's so easy, honestly. Uh, just come and ask somebody to pray for you. And if, and if you need somebody to help you through that, I can do that. I've released faith for healing. And that God might heal. Maybe you need to ask somebody to pray for healing for you. Uh, but let's stand. And if you want to come to the front for prayer or just turn to somebody else that you know to pray for you, let's also be seeking the Lord for what he has for us as well.